Greetings comrades, my name is Regantles, and this is another Church Council in a nutshell video. So today we'll be looking at the Council of Ephesus. So the Council of Ephesus was the Third Ecumenical Council. It took place in 431 AD, which was 50 years after the previous one. That was in Constantinople. The Pope at the time was Pope Celestine I, who was Pope between 422 to 432 AD. The President was Patriarch Saint Cyril of Alexandria, and was overseen by Emperor Theodosius II between 408 to 450 AD. So to give a background for this, as I told you before in the last episode, this mainly concerns the heresy of Nestorianism. So what happened was Nestorius, who was the Patriarch of Constantinople, when he was studying in Antioch, he started rejecting the title that of Theotokos, which means God-bearer, and instead of placed it with, Christ, with Christokos, which means Christ-bearer. And because of his teachings, he was questioned by, Saint, by Patriarch Saint Cyril of Alexandria, who, who tried to correct him. And he even had a synod of Egyptian bishops turn up to help condemn Nestorius for what he was saying. And he also wrote to Pope Celestine I, basically telling him what Nestorius was doing. And Pope Celestine gave Nestorius ten days to recant of his heresy or he'd be excommunicated. However, Nestorius tried to save himself by appealing to the emperor to convene a council, and so the Council of Ephesus was convened. So saying the heresies that were popping up before this council was actually pre-millennialism, and for those of you that don't know, pre-millennialism is, it basically says that Christ will return before a literal 1,000 years of his kingdom on earth. However, that is wrong. The current situation is amillennial, or amillennialism, in which Christ's thousand years were a metaphor for Christ's kingdom on earth which is meant to be the church and we are his subjects on earth. Nestorius when he was patriarch of Constantinople between 420 to 431 AD he claimed that Christ's human and divine nature divine natures and persons were distinct within him and they weren't in hypostatic union or mixed together as one. And the way to imagine this is you mix together red and blue two red and blue circles and you end up getting purple circle Nestorius would believe that Christ was half red, half blue, so half human, half divine. His natures were separate and not mixing together with one another. And during his conception in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, she would only have been the mother of his human nature, not his divine nature as well. Which would mean that that's where the title comes in, Christokos, which means Christ bearer, because she only bore Christ in the womb, not God. Whereas, it, as opposed to Theotokos, which means God bearer, because she bore, her, she bore God in her womb. The next heresy that was uh, popular at this point in time was a heresy called Pelagianism, and it was a little bit older than Nestorianism, but it was still quite damaging in terms of what it was teaching. And probably possibly one of the most interesting things you could ever see is an argument between a Pelagianist and a Protestant. Pelagianism is a heresy that was founded by the theologian Pelagius, starting around 380 AD, so a year before the last council, the first council of Constantinople. In it, he denied original sin. Yes, he denied original sin. He also claimed that God's grace wasn't needed to get to heaven. You only needed good works. Which is the exact opposite of the five solas that Protestantism teaches. He, he also supported free will. Which sounds a bit strange, but clearly the Calvinists would definitely hate him for that. And he also argued uh, several times with St. Augustine and St. Jerome, who try to keep things professional with him, but, well, he's still indulging his heresies. So it would be quite interesting to see a Pelagianist argue with a Protestant. You have someone who denies grace and accepts work, or you have, and then you have someone who denies works and accepts grace. And then for the Calvinists, you have someone who supports free will, and then they don't support free will at all. So, definitely the early church was an interesting place. And in 411 AD, there was a council in Carthage, in which Pelagius and, his, and a fellow supporter of his, Celestius, had to basically justify their beliefs. However, Pelagius, for some reason, didn't answer. And to go a bit more into depth about what this is. One, they believe Adam was created mortal. So he wasn't created perfect. He was, like you and I, he was as corrupted as we are. And that would quite contradict the extensive ages in Genesis, really. Two, Adam's sin did not corrupt other humans. So that's where he rejects original sin. Even though we know that we were all born with original sin. Three, infants are born into the same state as Adam before the fall of man. Which is also wrong, because we are all born into original sin. Although a lot of people don't like the idea that children can be born as sinners, and it is original sin, but 
that's not up to us to decide. It, it, it's a fact that exists regardless whether we want to accept it or not. In fact, St. Augustine, with his doctrine on original sin, clashed quite strongly with Pelagius in his uh, doctrine against original sin, so it was quite intense in the day. Four, Adam's sin did not introduce mortality, so death not due to sin, which also contradicts scripture quite strongly. Five, following God's law enables man to enter the kingdom of heaven, which is also wrong. You need both faith and works, okay? We need God's grace to help us get into heaven, but we don't, but we need more than just that. Okay, I've seen some examples. Some say you need a, like a car engine and a car frame to, to drive. And so faith is like having the car frame and then the works is having the engine. But the point is you need both works and faith to get into heaven. And Pelagius was denying you needing grace or faith. Really, you, you, any good person could just go to heaven without necessarily believing in God. Six, there were other humans beside Christ who were without sin, although they were very rare. And this is... Okay, we've got to be a bit careful with this one here. Everyone is born with original sin. There have only been five people in the entirety of history that have been born without original sin. That's Adam and Eve, who weren't technically born, but they were created without original sin. St. John the Baptist, who was not conceived without sin, but sometime before he was born, he was cleansed of sin, so that he could later on baptize Christ. Possibly when the, when the visitation happened. Jesus, obviously, because he was God. And the fifth person is the Blessed Virgin Mary, who was saved at, her, at the moment of conception through the Immaculate Conception from original sin. So only five people have been born without original sin. Though we've got to be a little bit careful here, because though it's possible that Pel uh, Pelagius was looking at the wrong sources, because in those days Christianity wasn't even 400 years old, whereas Judaism was almost 2,000 years old. And so the problem is that there's a lot of Jewish resources that you have to rely on then. If you have such a, a large amount of Jewish literature, it's not necessarily true, such as the Books of Enoch. And according to Jewish theology, there have been several people who were born without original sin. I could be wrong, I apologize if I am, but I think the Jews believe that Enoch and Noah had no sin on them. But effectively, Pelagius is saying it was possible for anyone to achieve this when it's wrong. Because everyone is born with original sin and everyone does sin in their life. The only exceptions are Adam and Eve who were born without original sin, but they did sin once and then they didn't sin for the rest of their life. Then you St. John the Baptist, who I don't think technically ever sinned, but he was still saved uh, before he was born. Then Jesus, but obviously he was God. And the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is the only person in history to both be born without original sin and to never have sinned in her entire life. That still varies massively from what Pelagius is trying to say. You cannot rely on works alone. And for the Protestants, do you think I'm agreeing with them? No, you cannot rely on faith alone either. I can go to the whole thing about the Immaculate Conception at another point. So the council convened, and there were 250 bishops present, so a little bit more than the last one. From these, several canons were produced. The first five canons effectively condemned Nestorius and Celestius as heretics. Pelagius, at this point in time, had died 11 years prior, that's which is why he wasn't in council to be condemned himself. The sixth canon basically said anyone who rejects what the councils conclude and define will be deposed from, ox from office and excommunicated. The seventh canon cemented the Nicene Creed in its place in Christendom. Of course, there's still need the filioque added at the end of it, but he was getting there. And the eighth canon condemned interference by the Bishop of Antioch in Cyprus, and basically was reiterating the legislation from the First Council of Constantinople in saying bishops need to keep their authorities and actions within their own diocese and not go into other dioceses. And Nestorius was exiled to a monastery in Antioch by the assistance of the Empress Pulcheria, the Empress Saint Pulcheria, who would actually become significant in the next council. And this would eventually lead to the Nestorians going to schism with Rome. Which is a bit strange, because although it could be considered the Nestorians almost seeming like on the fringes of the Empire and of Christendom, when Genghis Khan came to Europe and the cent Central Asia by invading and pillaging and raping and everything uh, during the Mongolian Empire, the Nestorians in his court effectively acted as mediators between Christendom and the Mongolian Empire, which is very interesting. I mean, so even some of his own family married Nestorian Christians. So it's quite important, this, that they managed to act as, almost as mediators between Christendom and the Mongolian Empire. So the Mongolian Empire existed peacefully alongside Christendom as, they, as the Mongolian Empire went and decimated the caliphates in the Middle East. Although there have been some more recent developments, in a sense. In 1994, there was the common Christological declaration between the Catholic Church and the Assyrian Church of the East. And it was between Pope St. John Paul II and Patriarch Dinka IV. Okay, interesting name. Which they basically do confirm the 
natures and divinity and humanity of Christ. And so, at the stage between the Catholic Churches and the Assyrian Churches, we can now receive communion from one another, effectively. And you have to be a little bit careful concerning the Assyrians, because I guess almost like one of the stereotypical things to do is to just completely label all the Assyrian churches as, as Nestorians when they follow what's believed to be the Antiochian branch of Christianity as opposed to the Alexandrian, which is what we Catholics follow. So when it comes to the Antiochian, only part of them are Nestorians, are Nestorians in a sense, or you could say almost in the spectrum they were like hardcore Nestorians. Some of them are a lot more in line with what the Catholic Church actually teaches. And actually, Patriarch Dinka IV, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He actually did correct up a few things with Pope St. John Paul II, in which he rejected several of the things that Nestorius himself taught, and also cleared up a couple of things in which he was trying to emphasize the oneness of Christ with the two natures within him. And so, although we're not fully in communion yet, we've definitely made a lot more progress now, which is very fortunate. So we are making progress in the East, and that's good. However, this problem with Nestorianism clearly wasn't going to be temporary and it was going to continue on for many many years even to this day there are plenty of Nestorians I've met several of them on upon Christian apologetics uh, for pages on Facebook which make very interesting debates but those debates will be another video so anyway that's the Council of Thesis in a nutshell if you like this video please do give it a like please do share my videos or please do comment on what you think of them in any other video you want me to do please subscribe to my channel so you can see more of this content and please do ring the bell so you can keep updated with my video releases especially my church councils in a nutshell series. Next episode, we're going to be looking at the Council of Chalcedon, which is quite significant. And the Coptic Church is quite important, especially this council, in terms of what happened and what happened after it. But that'll be for then. So anyway, see you next video, comrades. God bless you all. Until then.